It's state of state. We got your Nittany line update. It's a football discussion with Tom and Justin. So kick back and press play. With former Penn State and NFL defensive back Justin King, I'm Tom Hannafin. This is State of State. This podcast is presented by Bet Online. College football season is in full swing, and the last of the major pro sports leagues are off and rolling. Bet Online remains your top spot for all your live betting action and contests. College basketball is ready to go. The NFL, college football, and the NHL are all in play right now. Bet Online is your number one source for wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions. All the basketball betting action, along with every sport available at your fingertips, with both desktop and mobile access for every sport anytime. Head to betonline.ag today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Don't forget to use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. State of State is presented by Bet Online, where the game starts. Also, State of State is a proud supporter of Blue White Outfitters. Blue White Outfitters was created as a retail shop meant to highlight the confidence, competitiveness, and fear of the elite athletes found throughout the history of Penn State University. Check out the latest Lockdown U and Lawn Boys merchandise today. All sales from Blue White Outfitters directly benefit Penn State student athletes. Visit www.bluewhiteoutfitters.com today. And if you're looking for the perfect beer for Penn State football season, we've got you covered with the State IPA. Special thanks to our friends at Funk Brewing for creating the best tailgate and game day beer for Nittany Lion fans. A limited supply of the State IPA is still available now at beer distributors, grocery stores, Funk's tap rooms, plus select bars and restaurants. Visit www.funkbrewing.com slash beers slash state dash IPA to learn where and how you can get state IPA before it runs out for the season. Check out the link in the description of this podcast for more information. Must be 21 years or older to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Some breaking news in the world of Penn State football and what has been a headline-worthy weekend. In the wake of the 24-15 loss to Michigan, Penn State football has fired offensive coordinator Mike Yurcich effective immediately. This means that Penn State will see its sixth offensive coordinator during the tenure of James Franklin. For those of you keeping score at home, that means we have now seen the reign of John Donovan, Joe Moorhead, who is beloved, Ricky Ronnie, Kirk Soraka, and Mike Yursich. Donovan, Soraka, and Yursich all fired. Moorhead hired by Mississippi State. Ronnie hired by Old Dominion. So that is the rundown. We are going to get to what Penn State is doing uh, in terms of the interim offensive coordinators. That is an interesting layer to this as well. But Justin, let's sit with this news here for a second. Second, what did you think about this decision by James Franklin and Penn State football? Man, it was unexpected to be completely honest. Even when you uh, even speaking on if they would make a change at the end of this year, you would think it would wait till the end of this year, right? I mean, I didn't think that they would make almost like a knee jerk reaction, a very reactive type of situation. You can have two ways of looking at it, whether it's we're trying to kid our, our our aim going forward and get ready for next year. Or it's saying that, hey, this is our ultimate issue here to move forward with our offense. Both ways kind of leaves the current situation in limbo, whether it's like, hey, are, are we wrapping up the season? Is If we finish out 11 and 2, is that an um, unsuccessful season since the offensive coordinator is gone? How are you going to continue to retain your offensive uh, recruits? Um, just a lot of different things that just come into hand. When you think about firing your offensive coordinator at this point of the year, I mean, if you if we're saying that we lost to the top two of the top three teams in the country, and this is the first year for Drew to start, is there something deeper there? I'm not necessarily sure, but I don't. It's going to be interesting to see how they maintain the culture moving forward, and whether it's the defense playing at an elite level or maybe no gain, and if there's no. <laughs> consistent leadership on the offense with a dual um, offensive coordinator situation. We're talking about not having an identity moving forward and our clunky and inconsistent play to this point. It just makes you question like, okay, well, what is the plan of action moving forward? And was this the right time to call it quits on Mike Yersich? 
Uh, I want to thank everybody that is joining us live. Uh, hit subscribe, turn on notifications, comment. Obviously, the comment section is open to those of you that want. Uh, the super chat is available. All donations that go to the channel help us do things, uh, these live emergency shows uh, more often. So to that point, Farzad, thank you for the donation to the channel. Uh, this is more of a comment than a question. That This is the last step in Franklin's master plan. Got us out of sanctions to a consistent uh, to consistent success now he's got elite talent elite defense great special teams elite offense is the missing piece this is it so that's probably the most positive spin i've heard on this entire thing justin honestly in the last 24 hours because i've heard varying opinions of people saying that mike yursich deserves to be fired and that over the last three seasons now that we've seen him the offenses looked identical. And for a while there, a lot of people were pointing the finger at quarterback Sean Clifford, who I imagine is sitting somewhere in Green Bay, Wisconsin, shrugging to a degree because the offense that we've seen this season, even under Drew Aller and with all these you know bells and whistles, so to speak, it, it's looked virtually the same over the last you know three years, and there's been really no change. Uh, I'm of the mind that a change – probably needed to be made at offensive coordinator. And I think there's plenty of fans out there saying, absolutely, there needed to be a change at offensive coordinator. Here is my overarching concern, is that while play calling was certainly an issue against Michigan, against Ohio State, it's been an issue for a little while now. The overall issue for me is game management. And for 10 seasons now, that goes back to one person. And that's been James Franklin. Now, the challenge in this is that James Franklin made the decision to fire Mike Yersich. So the question all over social media is, what is the common denominator in all this? And it's James Franklin. And it keeps it keeps me asking the question, will, will one of two things happen? One, will James Franklin take a step back in terms of in-game control? Or will this administration take the drastic step to at some point fire him because let's not forget the other big story that came out today. Texas A&M just parted with Jimbo Fisher to the tune of a $76 million buyout. James Franklin's is $64 million. So in the grand scheme of things, it's slightly better, but I just reasonably don't see them pulling the trigger on firing Franklin. No, I do not see that happening. But that's interesting that you bring in the athletic director's standpoint from it because at the in the new age of college football with the realignment of the Big Ten Conference, his job is to sell the product on the field. And the one thing that we know when it comes to football, even as my time at the XFL League operations, like when we're selling this product for Vince McMahon, the thing is like it has to be exciting. And that comes from the quarterback and offensive play. Even if you have an elite defense and everything's working completely great, it's not that aesthetically pleasing. But when you have bad offensive play and inconsistent stuff from your quarterback, it is not an attractive product, especially when you start to lose, right? So I start to wonder, like, especially with Pat Kraft, the new leadership coming in, does he want to have his hand or his thumbprint on how the offensive or the product looks for Penn State when you talk about the offensive product? Because he's much more involved just on the sidelines involved in the game as it's going on and just involved in the athletics. So, I mean, he understands, he hears the, he hears the boos uh, when people are upset what's going on. He hears the chatter when uh, questionable fourth down calls happening or just whether it's a lack of talent. So even moving forward, you just start to question for this decision to happen right now. Like, why is it what influenced it? And where do you go from here? Because like, I think even if it is the right decision, like you said, the constant being James being there for the 10 years and this being the sixth offensive coordinator to come through, we have to start looking at the standpoint of like, okay, do we continue to move yourself out of the offensive philosophy of this team and just make yourself a complete CEO and bring in, uh, you know, a high level offensive coordinator that has his own offense where you just kind of let your hands go of everything that's going on and let them build that out. But just having some level of consistency. So even when you do have different coordinators, that there's a, a thread line of your identity that stays within the team. And if we have a process of having inconsistent offenses or let's say underperforming offenses outside of Joe Moorhead, we have to question like, is it your lack of identity that's being formed into the offense that we're seeing come through? But whatever that may be, try to get the same on the same category or the same wavelength as the defense has been operating. Because I think that's when 
you start to see things move up. And like I said, with a Pat Craft being there, more hands-on, talk about recruiting, NIL, you have to have money and a product that people want to believe in. Man, maybe this is a this is a, a a signal or a shout where it's like, hey, we're about business and we're moving forward. If you don't produce the way we need to produce, got to move on. You, you mentioned the business side of this and you talked about Pat Kraft and let's not forget new university president, Dr. Ben Napudi. For the first time in years under Franklin, we've heard the concept of alignment and you talk about that a great deal. And I, I think it's genuinely very important that you have the university finally uh, aligned in the proper way and that under Joe Paterno, Joe loomed large over the university and he had more control often than the president. So now that has just been put into the proper order of the president to the AD to the football coach. Um, I, I would find it extremely surprising if a first year president and a first year AD got together and decided to fire James Franklin at this point. I would just be completely stunned. And also Pat Kraft was brought in because one of the biggest parts of his resume, Justin, is that he's a fundraiser and mm -hmm. he can build a program. And people are saying, we don't need to build Penn State. It was like, well, we're rebuilding Beaver Stadium. And they've been talking about how this entire football program needs NIL money badly to keep up and compete with the Ohio States, the Michigans, and the upper echelon teams of the world. So taking a hit to the tune of $64 million doesn't really say fundraising, in my opinion. So that would be very, very difficult. Here's a layer that I don't know if people are considering. One of the big reasons that Drew Auer came to Penn State is because for years across multiple programs, he was recruited by Mike Yersich. So a question I ask, if I'm in, if I'm in the camp of Drew Auer, if I'm a fly on the wall in the mind of Drew Auer, do I stay at Penn State after 2023? If they're bringing a pretty high offensive coordinator, that's going to develop me as a quarterback and get me ready to play on Sundays. I mean, coming with a lot of promise as a five-star quarterback, I'm coming to a program like Penn State to maximize my talents and play on Sundays. So, I mean, a quarterback situation is a little funny, but it's not that if I'm Drew Aller, I wouldn't be hitching my wagon to Mike Yersich after kind of the performance that he's put out there because I don't know if he would be the hottest name on the block for him to go out there. But I think he should understand who's coming in not have any say, but understand what's coming in and what is expected of him moving forward to run an offense. Because again, there needs to be an identity I, like that's established and built around uh, and go from there and like build the personnel around that. And I think that's, that's something that that's a story that you can tell in the off season of like why you made this decision right now. It's like, Hey, we know that this is the step that we need to get over. We're out of the playoff hunt this year. So we might as well, this is the, uh, we might as well get ready for the, the championship run next year. So for us to do that, we need to get our offensive in, game in order because we have the defense ready. We have the depth there, but telling the story of where we got to move in offense. And the only way you do that right now, when you're about to close up, we figured that the recruiting cycle is about to close up in December. So we're talking the story that we're telling recruits to retain their commitments and attract new guys. This is a part of it. We're like, Hey, we're looking and determining that our offensive structure needs to change for us to make that next step. I think that's the verdict that they're coming to. Now, how they tell that story and what they do about that, time will tell. This is a really challenging 24 hours. I do come back to the term that you used earlier, knee-jerk decision. I think often some of these decisions can be made because it's so fresh off of such a painful loss. So those happen all the time in – major sports. And you understand that very, very well, having worked on both sides as an athlete, as a coach, as a, a member of the personnel staff, like you understand that. But I still think this was a, a decision that had to be made. I just don't think it fixes everything. And if anything, Mike Yurcich is, is he being made out to be the scapegoat of what happened against Michigan and Ohio State? To a degree, it's warranted. To a degree, I, I think, yes, he is being made to be the scapegoat because the problems, I think, run deeper. Um, I mean, go ahead. No, I think there, there's something to be said when you say six uh, offensive coordinators in a 10 year span and you can only point to a few years where I guess they uh, they uh, uh, performed above the line. Right. Like sometimes we could say the, the points per game is a uh, is not a true indicative of how dominating the offense should be, whether it's an exciting football game or not. But 
outside of that, like you said, it's been a constant where it's been a clunky offense and a lack of quarterback development, to be completely honest. Um, and from that standpoint, if that's something that we need to develop as a program in general, right? When you say like, oh, Penn State hasn't put any quarterbacks in the NFL or had any elite guys on on that side of the ball outside of this, outside of the you know elite skill positions that we've had in the past, how do you fix that? I mean, get somebody that runs the offense the right way, and whether that's James taking a backing up from wherever that piece is, being more of a CEO to the whole situation, but. It's a quite interesting, interesting uh, job opportunity for upcoming offense coordinators, or do they get someone that's established that's going to demand complete control of how they move forward? And, and James Franklin has been on the record in the past that his defensive coordinator and his offensive coordinator are the head coach of the defense and the head coach of the offense. But still, for me, it's the insertion of Franklin on critical fourth down decisions, the insertion of Franklin on critical two-point conversion attempts where just mathematically most rational people can look at and say this doesn't make sense and and that's a real problem for me just as a fan I know some people based on analytics disagree with some of those points but just certain certain decisions yesterday didn't add up so that that's a whole other thing and again I made the point about what you know for those fans out there that are you know in the comment section right now saying fire Franklin if you got 64 million dollars lying around there's your choice and then it's like, I, I would like to believe, Justin, that this is not a university and athletic department that is content with a football program that is really good, not just national title good. Because right now, three times this season, Beaver Stadium's had 110,000 fans in it. Last, uh, yesterday was the second largest crowd in the history of Penn State football. So it does beg the argument of, well, why don't we just let this ride? Because from a business standpoint, we're still making money hand over fist. And it doesn't like, what's that investment going to be for us to get that, you know, inch closer, a couple inches closer and try and win a national championship. So there's the business side of all this that is mind bending. And now for the remainder of this season, for those of you that are wondering, uh, this comes directly from uh, bluewhiteillustrated.com. Our good friends over there, Thomas Frank Carr, shout out to him. Uh, the co-offensive coordinators will be, uh, running backs coach Juwan Sider and tight ends coach Ty Howell. So the, uh, let's see, Sider uh, picked up the co-offensive coordinator title ahead of the 2022 season, joined the Lions ahead of the 2018 season. His only prior play calling experience came as the offensive coordinator at Palm Beach Lakes High School in his native state of Florida from 03 to 05, many years ago. That said, he has been long awaiting for an opportunity to be either a head coach or play caller at the FBS level. You and I have touched on that in the past when we've spoken about him and with Journey Brown on this show. Meanwhile, Ty Howell uh, is Letterman, who was the co-offensive coordinator at Western Illinois from 2018 to 2019. Considering the remainder of the schedule, you're at home against Rutgers and then you're on the road on a Friday night in, uh, in Detroit at Ford Field against Michigan State. Uh, you better be able to beat those teams, even with two co-offensive coordinators when you hear co-offensive coordinator does that worry you at all i know you know the makeup of howell and cider very well uh does it worry me not necessarily i think it goes into more of the problem bucket of or risk bucket of lack of identity if they're it's just like it's just two people getting the call to plays right like i don't know if they're going to split play calling duties or how they're going to split up the offensive coordinator um responsibilities but from that standpoint, I think it's a great opportunity for them both to get a chance to game plan for a week, sit in the offensive coordinator chair, hopefully do some play calling and game plan um, and show their offensive philosophy. But I think that also lends well to the standpoint of we're chalking up this year to get ready for next year and what we need to do to make that move. So I would compare it to almost like the NFL when like the Rams say like, Hey, like forget these picks. We're going to make all these picks and get some big players to make the Super Bowl run. And like you said, I don't think they're, I don't think Penn state's going to eat a $64 million buyout for James Franklin, like Texas A&M did, or even if they should, but making a move, like getting rid of someone like Mike Yersich, that was credited for bringing in the five-star quarterback and all the things that he's done from that standpoint and getting rid of him at this moment. Again, I think the recruiting 
um, deadline or the early signing period has something to do with it when you're telling the story of prospects coming in, whether it's quarterback still committed or they still, you know, what's the situation? Because you have to like make sure that they continue to sign their letter of intent. But it's making sure that you get an offensive identity ready for the offseason so that it's the program is put in, Andrew has the best success best chance of being successful next year and that the offense isn't an obstacle for the elite defense and personnel that you have on the team because they played good enough defense and special teams to beat to beat Ohio State and Michigan it's just it's a gut punch when you don't have any help from the offensive side of football uh this is by no means accurate but a comment here from panos that uh grunkemeyer could decommit that is just a projection it's not any accurate information so panos i understand how you're feeling you know ethan grunkemeyer is a highly touted recruit for those that don't know penn state very excited about him is there a possibility that he decommits i think any but the thing is possible right now um bo perbula who i know we have talked a lot about and everybody's been talking about this bo perbula package and getting a glimpse of it against maryland and then you don't see it all of a sudden it's just it is what it is so like yeah if drew aller were for instance to fall out of love with penn state do you use perbula for three years it's like theoretically but who's to say bo perbula could be disappointed by this maybe he came here more for year six and for franklin you you just you just don't know here's a really good question from josh penn state will have our next year at quarterback obviously the hope of many but does penn state do better with a dual threat quarterback under franklin i'll go ahead and answer this yes they have, uh, under James Franklin, you can go back to his time at Vanderbilt, he has always preferred a smaller quarterback who is dual threat, doesn't have the biggest arm, but he can run a little bit, maybe a 4-6, maybe a 4-5 type of guy, and he can move the ball down the field and he can create mismatches and you can run those mesh plays and those RPO plays. That is over a decade old under James Franklin. And look at Trace McSorley, look at, I know people are not going to necessarily say overwhelming success of Sean Clifford, but Sean Clifford having success at times. And then you now look at Bo Perbula when he's been inserted into the game has certainly been a spark, but he fits the identity of this offense. So it, it, it does kind of make you wonder, Justin, did Mike Yersich really have complete control over the identity of this offense? Or was it, here's what we do, you know, drive my car for me. I think it was a little bit of both, right? I think Yurisich's offense was never that dynamic to begin with. Even when he was at Texas or at the previous places, he was always leaning into his personnel. Like it was pretty much like, again, the basic aspect of having playmakers run and execute his offense. And not to say, I mean, and we do need an uptick in, in playmakers that can make big plays, but you also have to have you have to have some guts and like like you say, run four verticals every once in a while, like stretch the offense and make sure that you have the personnel to align with the theory that you want to go go against the defense. Like if your theory is like, hey, we're going to be an aggressive offense, well, make sure that you have aggressive players, right? Whether it's on the outside, play, uh, break making playmakers, offensive threats like a quarterback that can run when things break down um, and just build around that. But you have to have some consistency. Like I don't want to beat a dead horse, but six offensive coordinators – in 10 years, it's hard to get some type of rhythm, especially when you go with the theory of the offensive coordinator as the head coach of the offense and the defensive coordinator as the head coach of the defense. If you have two different brains kind of building, uh, you know, I'm not saying conflicting personalities in the offense and the defense, which we've seen, but if there's no consistency over the six different offensive coordinators, you're going to have problems producing what you need to produce. So hopefully they get somebody in there that knows and understands how to build an offensive identity that fits Penn State's personnel and how they play football and just going from that standpoint because, I mean, that's what's keeping them from that that tier of being an elite program. And that's what separates elite programs all the time because, like, it happens with, uh, like I say, Alabama when they were on their runs. Like, they had a Lane Kiffin. They had a Mike Loxley. But there was a thread of whatever – was going on still came down from Nick Saban and it was like, Hey, this is how we're going to run it. This is the personnel that we have. And like the, and you went along with the times and made sure that that happened. And that, and we haven't done that yet. Right. So that's something that needs to happen. And especially to continue to get the players in the bucket. That's what I, one thing that I'm going to continue to piece together is like having the personnel that wants to play in an exciting offense is critical. So like when you're out here selling, Penn State's uh, upcoming offensive recruits. Like you want to have someone that says, like, look what they've produced. 
right? Like, you know what I mean? Just for example, a, a, someone like a Brennan Marion, who's everywhere he's gone, he's someone that you can point to like, hey, look at the production that he's had now here at UNLV, here with these receivers, with his go-go offense, and you get a, a chance to sell that vision. Not that he, he might be a guy for it, or a Cliff Kingsbury or um, just different. Josh, Josh Gaddis's name is being thrown in the comment section. We'll just throw him out there. Even I mean, well, Gat coming back, but he's had his own little hiccups and, and clunkiness. And there's like, there might be, it might just meet a whole new fresh slate. You know what I mean? Because even when Joe Moorhead came in from working with uh, James, he wasn't, he never really worked with him before. And I think that was one of the most successful offensive coordinator relationships that we've seen with Penn State and him. But I mean, if they both come from the same background, I'm just saying we might just need something completely fresh from like an offensive perspective or an offensive philosophy and schematic standpoint. So, I'm going to be interested to see it because to get high-flying receivers and fun offensive players, you have to show them like, hey, look what we do. <laughs> That's yeah. how you bring in the talent you need. The the personnel, the playmakers, you, you talked about it, needs to th – those need to improve. Now, I'm not trying to slight – I think we have an excellent tight end room. I think Penn State has Absolutely. outstanding running backs. So I'm not questioning those positions really, but wide receiver is certainly left wanting. And that was something we've known for a little while, even no disrespect to Parker Washington when he, when he was here, that receiver core felt a step down from the time that Jahan Dotson was there. And Dotson, clearly a playmaker. So you need to go get a guy, a couple guys like that. Here's another thing. This is a comment here from Glenn. Won't be surprised if Drew transfers. They have no wide receiver talent next year. It's Franklin's fault. Big time misses on getting playmaker talent at wide receiver. Kind of what I was just saying, but I, I bring it up because there's an analogy here that I, I'd like to make. So bear with me, Justin. One of the things that I personally, as a fan and as a broadcaster, was concerned about is that this is a five-star, highly touted quarterback coming to Penn State. When Drew Aller was being recruited, everybody was like, man, he's he's a pocket passer. He's got a cannon for an arm. He's a little mobile. God, what arm talent he has, all these things. And for me as a longtime fan, it was eerily reminiscent of the recruitment of Christian Hackenberg and the same exact conversation, the same exact hype. And then when Hackenberg got here, granted, it was in the midst of the Jerry Sandusky scandal and finally getting his footing. Then he's working with Bill O'Brien. Then he's working with James Franklin. The constant churn, he has been on the record on Adam Brenneman's show, uh, I believe, multiple times now talking about how it just got to him after a while. And he was getting his butt kicked on a regular basis physically, just getting hit a lot to the point after the 2013 season, he went to the National Football League because, in his own words, he just had enough and he needed a change of scenery. And it has been on the record. As I mentioned, that interview with Adam Brenneman was phenomenal. It was eye-opening to the point that he was like, I just couldn't, he just couldn't do it anymore. And he probably went to the NFL earlier than he thought he should have. So now you have Drew Aller, who against Ohio State and against Michigan has been beaten up. And it's not to say that this is the worst offensive line I've seen under James Franklin, but it's certainly had its struggles. Obviously, there's individual talents like Olu Fashanu uh, that have really shined and other pieces of that offensive line that have great potential potential on Sundays and beyond. But you, I, I, if I'm Drew Aller and being very reasonable, I'm sitting back because this is the age of the transfer portal. This is the age of NIL. And we really don't know what coaches have mastered or at least become experts on this age of college football, Justin. I know you work in this space a ton. If you're Drew Aller, you finish the season, you get into bowl season, whatever that bowl game will be, and I know a lot of Penn State fans are already saying it's meaningless, but if you're Drew Aller, do you wait and see who that hire is? And if it doesn't impress you, are you gone? Are you gone? I mean, are you absolutely quite, you look at the, the landscape and see where your options are. Because I think even when you talk about jumping into the transfer portal, you got also have to consider your value, right? Because he hasn't been taking the – yeah, he hasn't been completely absolvent of everything that's happened on the offense, whether it's like a little bit of there in the headlights, just different areas in it, right? We can just say there's blocking situations, receivers, but – at the same time, you got to also understand where your market value is before you jump in the transfer portal. Do I think you'll get picked up for, by a team? Absolutely. Right. But I just think it's much harder to switch teams, even though we have Joe Burrows and guys like that that move as quarterbacks to go into a full situation where everything is completely in your favor. I don't think he's going to just transfer to a team that's going to have a top five defense 
ready to play on the back end. I don't think he's going to be able to transfer and even have the pieces in place if we're just suspecting that it's a lack of identity and some glue pieces to bring everything together and he can still be that person to do that. But, I mean, if a offensive coordinator comes in that doesn't really run his type of offensive style, he has to be completely honest with it. But is he sure what his offensive style is? Like, he hasn't had... I mean, this year has been you know, a, like a roller coaster. So, like, where does he really fit in into that thing? As I mean, I can bring up a real a comment here where it's just like someone said, Jason Candle as an offensive coordinator, head coach at, at uh, Toledo, and like that's an interesting one too, just in the sense of how many receivers and NFL talent that they've developed at that level at the receiver standpoint, right? Even from, you know, I mean, just. I mean, I can't even off the top of my head um, bring in any type of any type of guys, but that's a very interesting piece there. And it's it's going to be a, a top end job, but someone that has to have had a history of putting up a lot of points and creative and entertaining offense. I think it's going to be critical with the Pac-12 merging into the Big Ten because there's a certain game of football that's going to be played like the they invest in their offense out there. We know that they'll give up 50 points in a heartbeat because they, hey, we'll score 60. So that's something that we got to also catch up with because, I mean, it's pretty scary when you can't beat teams and you can keep them to under 30 points. There's a, a lot of people in the comments section talking about uh, just elevate Juwan Sider. And you know, we, we talked about it moments ago is that the co-offensive coordinators for the remainder of the season are going to be tight ends coach Ty Howell and running backs coach Juwan Sider. Two fantastic position coaches for the record. I, I hope Penn State retains guys like those for a long time, whether in their positions or elevates them. So I think Sider as an internal candidate, that wouldn't be uh, out of the realm of possibility. James Franklin has done that in the past. So I, I, I have no issue with that. I actually like that idea, even though I just read off. Yeah, it's been a minute since he's called some plays. The uh, flip side of the ball, the other thing we aren't even thinking about this is that I'm curious how Manny Diaz receives this. Because like, we were even concerned, Justin, about like, man, he's he's obviously put on tape the last two seasons that he can coach the hell out of a defense, whether he's the D.C. here, D.C. someplace else, or he wants to be a head coach all over again, that Miami has proven to be a bit of a dumpster fire, and that wasn't all his fault. So, you know, what does Diaz do now after this? You know, is, does he receive Franklin axing Yursic as the right decision or as the incorrect decision? I mean, it's pretty tough when you call some elite defenses and you don't really have anything to show for it, right? Like a championship or just someone on the other end because you kind of hold up your end. And that's internal conflict that you have sometimes with elite defenses versus lackluster offenses. But I, I would think if I'm him, I would want to see a change on the offense, right? Because like we're playing at a level that is that we're able to win. So he's going to be a tough one to keep, but at the same time, like I said, like they're if they're this close and we're trying to deem that it's the offensive coordinator and bringing those things together, how much better do you get? <laughs> I I want to I want to wrap this up and I'm going to steal a line from Dabo Sweeney of all people, not my favorite human being that's walking the planet, but uh, a comment he made recently in terms of expectation versus appreciation for what. Uh, he and his staff have done multiple national titles down there at Clemson. Clemson's on you know difficult times and they've you know fallen off a little bit, but still getting pretty ticked off at a guy named Tyler from Spartanburg. The expectation coming into this season from Penn State fans was to contend for a Big Ten title and maybe contend for the college football playoff and maybe even the national championship. All of those things are off the table at this point in time, barring something catastrophic regarding Ohio State and Michigan, which I just. <laughs> I just don't foresee. Uh, the, those were the expectations, and you can feel the the anger, the frustration from the Penn State fan base and the Penn State community as a whole. And I'm sure there's that type of feeling inside the building, inside the program, that this that there were these big expectations. And do you do you feel like you know the, a potential ten and two season isn't appreciated, or is it at a point with Penn State where it's like? It's not good enough because I'm on the ladder that it's like we keep talking about getting over the hump. It's not good enough. I mean, it's not good enough, right? And I think there is a level of just not building like that culture on the offensive side of football to be consistent enough to win big time football games against programs like Ohio State and Michigan. Um, and that's really like the question that leadership needs to make when you have hard decisions like this. Are we going to be a very good program? Or are we going to be a great program, right? Because 
it's the margin of error is right here. And to be able to jump over there, you have to be able to make those hard decisions of getting rid of coaches and like putting your step, foot down, like this is how we're going to build this thing, hell or high water, come hell, come hell or high water, right? Moving forward. But it's going to be interesting to see who they bring in the offense. I mean, I don't think Drew Aller eventually transfers. I mean, just better hope he continues to play well enough to keep his job, right? Because I don't think anything's solidified just moving around just in this college ecosystem because we see that the the price is heightened, right? Like there's going to be more spots to get into the playoffs next year. And so like we have to make sure things are operating at a level that gives us a chance to play. And that, and I mean, that comes down to having the right offensive minds in there, right personnel and the culture on offense. Man, I talk about culture and identity a lot because when it comes down to football, man, that's what you're planning. As everybody can talk about the analytics or um, just the calls and the schematics of it. But at the end of the day, it's a mono a mono. And if you're not, ha- if you don't have the, like the right mentality of players with the right coaches, putting in the mentality and building the culture within that area, I mean, we're going to continue to have these things because at a place like Penn State, you're going to win nine to 10 games, right? And then sometimes it's it's good to get paid a lot of money and win. Like that's a, that's a, that's a great, sure. yeah, that's, that's good. I mean, win nine to 10 games. But when you want to talk about getting great or being in that, in the playoffs and winning a championship, you got to cut through the, the BS and really figure out what it is and, and stand on it. It's a complicated time right now for Penn State. Uh, I, you know, the, the sky doesn't. I know to some people that it feels like the sky is falling. It's still an eight and two team. You still got two games left to play. Still got a, a bowl game definitely to play in here at some point. So uh, there's a lot that can potentially happen. Want to thank everybody that hopped on here. This is a great response online from all of you in the comment section and tuning in live for this podcast. So we're going to get this posted up on our audio only platforms. Like, comment, subscribe rate us turn on notifications tell us how you guys feel about this uh and this wednesday we will have our preview episode for penn state versus rutgers so uh be tuned for that lots more to come with the penn state football program thank you all so much for joining us this episode and our entire library of shows is available now on youtube apple Podcasts, spotify google Podcasts. Tune in and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, let us know what you think of the show on Twitter at the King one and at Tom Hannafin. State of State is presented by Bet Online.